My name is uh, Joe Matias. I'm part of the missions committee, and today is the last uh, Sunday of our missions conference. And we have uh, two uh, missionary families that we'll be uh, hearing from today. And uh, the first one that we're going to be uh, hearing from are Jonathan and Brenda Tuttle. Uh, we're missionaries with GMI uh, to Nicaragua. Thank you, Joe. Good morning, uh, Frontline Bible Church. Um, I'm Jonathan, Jonathan Tuttle, and this is my wife. Brenda. <laughs> and this is our daughter. Emma Jean. Oh, uh, not yet, not yet. Emma Jean. Um, uh, we are so excited to be here um, in Michigan. We're from Eastport, New York, Long Island. Um, some of you guys know where that is, and um, we're just thankful for the opportunity to be here and to share exactly how God led us to want to do missions and want um, us to serve in uh, Nicaragua in Central America. So, yeah, it's been a um, cool adventure. And, um, yeah, we're moving down there to, uh, to work and serve with Milo and Raquel Saravelli. Some of those, those two faces might look familiar. They were here, I think, two years ago or a year ago. And um, they uh, planted a church in Nagarote, Nicaragua, um, like kind of in the center of the country, kind of by... Lake Managua, but we're going to be going um, down south with them. Um, they're the Corderos there, um, that's Aron and Idalita. They're going to stay back in uh, the Arigados Church, and Milo and Raquel and us, we're going to go to another area to work. So, um, oh yeah, GMI. So the Vision 2033, that's kind of what's uh, driving this growth, and um, we're the um, what they're looking for is, yeah, uh, to reach one new continent, um, eight new fields, and uh, they want to have 30 new families or individuals coming on to the mission and working with them. And we'll be, we're one of those, one of those 30 families. So that's cool. It's, it's, uh, it's growing. So, uh, so Brenda wanted to share a little bit what led her to her path to missions. Good morning. My name is Brenda. Um, I'm original from Mexico. I grew up in a Catholic short, um, home. Um, but yeah, I never really read, we never really read the Bible before or understand uh, who Jesus was and what he did. Um, until I was 19 years old, a Christian friend invited me to her church and I liked the fellowship. So I started joining everything, basically just adding church to my life but no really understanding the gospel until a year later that I received uh, Jesus' gift of salvation and I truly surrendered my life to him, not to only be my savior, but to be the Lord of my life and to guide my life. So I was content with what he was doing in my heart, in my life, but it was mostly all about me, what he can, uh, what he was doing in my life and, and the church, how they were like basically feeding me and just me, me until three years later I went to a, some, um, to a camp that was like a, a missionary team. Um, basically different churches gather and we just hear um, missionaries sharing their experience, what God was doing around the world. Um, and I remember just been thinking this is crazy, like why they would do that. And I just thought like it was something that I, I could never do. Um, but the idea stuck with me. Um, even after weeks, and I keep thinking, like, why are I even debating in my heart, like, trying to convince myself that no, that no, no, that's something crazy. So one day I just stop, and I pray, and I say, okay, God, like, if this is you, like, you must do something in my heart, because I don't feel I have the courage to care for other people. Um, and he, he started doing it. So I was working in a hotel as a receptionist, and every time after work, I had to cross to a park that was uh, known by many, but homeless, homeless. So I remember just feeling always um, God telling me, stop, and told to them, stop. I was like, no, <laughs> like, I mean, I'm a girl, that's dangerous, um, what I'm going to say, and I mean, I don't I know. Um, but then one day I say, okay. So I grabbed two sandwiches, and I went, and I sit with one of them. And yeah, long story short, I basically become really good friends, or close friends, to three of them. And what I did was just coming after work, bringing my lunch, and sitting with them, eat with them, share who I was, 
who I am now in Christ, um, sharing what I was learning at church, sharing what I was learning by my own reading, and the God um, touched their hearts, and the three of them become uh, saved. So they receive the Lord, and not only that, like God wasn't just stopping there, he also opened doors for them to change the situation where they were living at. And to me, that was like, like it just truly really changed everything. I, I, I just saw like how God was working and how I could be just used. I didn't do anything. Like I didn't have to change the way they think or anything. I was just basically participating and whatever God was leading me and just obeying that. And I, that really changed my heart to have the courage to care for other people's salvation, for what is God's mission something that is bigger than myself. So I was really impacted by that. But as I said, I was working in a hotel, so I wanted to learn English to get a better position. And I was looking for ways to learn quick, um, cheap. So I find this program, I don't know if you ever hear, Opera in America. So I signed, and my process went so fast, and in three months I was here. And I, the way I see it now is I had this picture, like when I hold my baby hands, I just walk with her, wherever I go, she follows me without asking or anything. And I just feel like by then I had that trust to, to God, like basically I was holding and I knew he was my heavenly father and I know he would take care of me. And I just jump. And just looking back, I also can see how this also was a path for missions, to come into a different country that I didn't know anybody and just trusting that I is going to be okay with God. Um, so yeah, I came here in 2014 as an au pair. Um, and then it was, the first year was just working in my room. I didn't know anybody, so I just got deep in reading the Bible and my relationship with Jesus until I, next, the next year I decided to extend another year in the program, and I say, well, um, communion is important. Like, I'm part of the body of Christ, so I'm going to look for a church. So I was looking for a church, and I found East Pro Bible Church, and I went there. It was 10 minutes from the town I was living, and it was the missions conference. So this time, this was my second exposure to what missionary is, someone who goes to a different country and someone who cares for what is God's mission. Um, to reach in other people that we don't even know yet. But um, I remember this was more personal. Um, I remember hearing and talking with Julia Lies, um, and she was single by then. So I thought, oh, I can do this. I can, I'm single. I can go and, and serve you, Lord, whatever you want. But of course, God's plans are always better than us. And I met my husband in the same church. Um, and he also had the desire to serve the Lord, and that was really like, uh, wow, like, we both want to do this. So, yeah, um, we did meet in eSport. It was pretty sweet. We came from different, two different countries, and we met in eSport. Um, what really led us to this decision to um, want to be missionaries, it really comes down to God's word and the hope and the eternal life that Jesus Christ offers. That's, that's the reason. And um, Mark 16, 15, Jesus says here, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel. And um, the question is, who will go? Um, and I took a class in, um, in college. It was called Perspectives in the World Christian Movement. And it just um, talked about the huge need in the world for um, Christian workers to go out. And it was um, really highlighted that some countries don't allow um, Christian workers to go, some countries there's a lot of restrictions from the governments to let them to even talk about Jesus and, and um, do missions work. So there is a huge need for more workers to go and share about Jesus in the near and the distant corners of the world. I needed to do something about it, and it was a desire um, that wouldn't go away even after I got a better job and climbed up the ladder in the job. It still wouldn't go away. I would go home every day on um, my home, and I was just like, ah, oh, it's not going away, this... This job is not taking away this desire, this calling in my in my heart every day. And I need to do what God put on my heart. And it was what I felt like I was made for and for through the different challenges and 
um, situations in my life that God trained me for this, and I really needed to do something about it. And the second verse is um, Romans 10, 13. How can they hear without someone preaching to them? And that's the question we need to ask ourselves and that we need to ask, um, yeah, um, as we share the gospel with the world. Um, there needs to be people who speak about Jesus here and near and far away. And um, I realized that I could speak about Jesus and that I could have an effect, and I didn't need to be Billy Graham to do it. Um, when I went to, um, uh, back in Long Island, uh, one of our uh, churches from Eastport, or from Long Island, or no, from Michigan came out to visit us, and they came out to the Bronx to do a missions trip. And uh, I'll never forget it, but um, we did like a gospel presentation and outreach in a little park in the Bronx. And this little 10-year-old kid comes up to me and wants to pray with me, and um, I just couldn't believe it. And I got to um, be a part of leading him to Christ, and, um, and just the, the fact that he wanted to come to me and that he wanted me to pray with him and that um, he wanted me to explain some more things was like, it blew me away that, wait, I, I, I can lead a kid to it's It's God's power who works through us. It's not us. It's not our power. It's God that does that. And um, I just, I, I couldn't get, get, uh, get rid of that feeling. It just stayed with me for, like, years. And every time I, like, worked with kids and stuff, it's just something I desire, and I desire to lead people to Christ that they, they know and um, can experience eternal life someday. So um, another thing that impacted me were, was these, uh, these college students that I was with in Grace, um, Christian University, what it's called now. They were uh, missionary kids. They were a bunch of pranksters, but they were good. They were... Um, the, the Beefuses and uh, Kemper, and uh, they, well, the, the Beefuses, they all spoke Spanish, so um, they wanted, they made me really want to learn Spanish, and uh, basically they helped me, Caleb, specifically with a word every day, so over a couple of years, I was able to get more and more Spanish, and that really um, made me want to um, use my Spanish, um, and uh, yeah, I was, I was actually studying the Intercultural Studies program at Grace, and um, right after that, um, I was able to go to Costa Rica for three months to learn um, Spanish from the best teachers. The best teachers are little kids, if you don't know. They have patience, they want you to know, and they won't give up. They don't really give up at all. So I had these, Glenn and Harry, um, they, I was with them every day and they really got me going in Spanish. Um, then after that, I was able to go to South America with uh, Talo Vergala. Talo Vergala's ministry down there, but while he was in uh, Argentina and Chile, and I was able to do an outreach and orphanage work program for six months, and it was very impactful for me. And um, yeah, a year later, um, after all this, we, we actually uh, met in New York. So me and Brenda met, and um, yeah, we, um, there was an opportunity a year after we met to do a missions trip together, and this was very impactful. It allowed me and Brandon to see that we could work together um, doing missions, and I went with my family and a couple other people from the church. My brothers are in the corner of the picture, and we went to Nicaragua, Nagarota, Nicaragua, so that kind of got our attention, and that was the first time we went there, and then uh, a year after that, we got married in Mexico, and um, so Brenda couldn't exactly come back to the U.S. right away. We had to wait for visas and stuff, so um, it allowed us to have some opportunities in, um, in Mexico and in uh, other places to do ministry work because we, we knew we needed, we had something to do and we could do it wherever and God opened doors for that. So um, we were able to go to uh, um, a campus that is called Sun Life Costa Rica and they, they basically train missionaries in um, a strategy called discipleship. Um, that's like meeting one-on-one -on -one with people and just having something to share and being and making disciples of Christ. So. <laughs> yep, yep. Uh, it's okay. Um, yes, just like Jonathan said, the two year and a half that I had to stay in Mexico waiting for my resident, um, now just looking back, it's funny because I thought the English that I learned, I was going to go back to use it um, to work in the hotel, but God was using it to do his work, um, just sharing his grace uh, with people that I didn't know. So for during those two years and a half waiting for the resident, uh, we were doing that, like just doing mission streets, short mission street inside Mexico. Um, and then finally in 2019, I was able to um, come back and be here in, uh, in the U.S. with Jonathan. Um, yeah, so we use uh, serve in our church and especially trying to reach the Latin community. 
um, and that's how we, um, yeah, this song one and one, uh, putting in practice this discipleship, and we saw like that was a great idea. Um, just follow what Jesus did too. In 2022, I I finished the process of the citizenship, and then we got the blessing to be parents. So uh, Emma born in December 2022, and then we say, okay, we're gonna start praying more intentionally to where to go. And in last summer, 2023, we went to Nicaragua to help with the kids uh, games. Um, where we were there, we our friends shared um, his desire to move to a different place to start another church and from scratch. So we felt, yeah, compelled to go and help and just serve with them alongside with them. Um. Cool. So we're going to um, San Marcos, Nicaragua, and um, yeah, so we're going to um, yeah help out Mila and Raquel and learn from them, and we are also yeah going to serve. And we know that it takes. Um, years to make a long and long lasting impact and grow a church from nothing. And um, yeah, we just see that. <laughs> nice. And we desire to learn. Yeah, we desire to uh, work in this new city. So there's about 33,000 people. There's a little university in the center of it. So there's definitely some opportunities for college student outreach. And um, we it's also close to connect to a lot of other communities and lots of opportunities. And um, it's two hours south of the current work in Nagarote. And uh, we visited this past year on um, this July to uh, pray in the park and see God's leading. And um, yep, now we're that's where we're hoping to be. So hopefully in July we'll get there. Um, so back in Eastport, and, um, and, and now our vision is sharing and teaching about Jesus Christ to make disciples who multiply themselves. And this was our group that we, um, that we would meet with on a weekly basis. And, and um, God also prevent, presents opportunities in your work as well. I was able to meet and disciple with people in our work and lunch break. We all probably get 30 minutes for our lunch break, and God can use that time for sure. And um, yeah, we want to build relationships in the community and uh, study one-on-one -on -one weekly. And we want to invest in the lives of new believers. And it's funny the cool impacts that you can have in a discipling relationship. You can see God working weekly and bringing um, new questions to light in their minds as, they, as you study. And it really, they let their guard down because they're not like in a church. They just, they, they want to know and they want to um, understand Jesus. And this is the perfect opportunity for them to ask questions and learn from, learn from the word of God. So what are we going to do exactly in Nicaragua? And that's uh, disciple um, believers and non-believers to hopefully they'll be believers someday. And um, that we want to um, have a small group, a mom's group. Brenda was very impacted by a mom's group we had back in Eastport. Moms can support each other and the different things they go through. And um, I, want, I really want to have a men's group, kind of like you guys have here. And um, I, I was a mechanic back in the day, so I like to teach technical stuff and, and rub off on each other in that way. So, um, and we also want to assist in worship. I play the guitar. And we love kids' ministries, and we want to be a part of that. And we've helped out. And we want to, yeah, we want to assist this church in Nagarote as well. It's two hours away, but we can help when they need help. So we're excited to help with them. So yeah, we are right now here raising a support team. Um, and why? Because as missionaries, we don't go and do this work alone. We need you all. We are still part of the body of Christ. So this is a word that we are all co-workers of our same kin. Uh, we need your prayers. Uh, this is super important because, yeah, we need to pray for the people that they have open ears and open hearts and open minds to receive the gospel. And also for us, for the work that we are doing. And when we are in um, contact with you, we can also pray for you. And that way we build each other up. Um, we need, yeah, your financials to keep this ministry um, full time. And you see it as investing in God's kingdom or investing in what God is doing around the world. Um, just because, yeah putting your treasures in heaven and not just here on air. Um, and also the connection. We need a connection. Like we don't want to feel missionaries are way out there and you guys are way out here. It's kind of like thinking God is way out there and you're way here. If it's communication, then it's, it's, it's connection and that's important and necessary. Um, so this is yeah, so we're about um, we're about 36 percent uh, raised to go there, and we hope to be in there in July. So, yeah, in the next couple of months, we hope to raise all the funds that are needed to get to Nicaragua. 
So how can you pray for us? And that's important. Don't forget about us when we go. Don't forget us. Hopefully you have your, our missionary card on the refrigerator like we had for the missionaries that visit our house. And uh, we hopefully um, you guys could pray for us weekly just for uh, safety in our travels. Pray for us for our transition from the U.S. culture to Nicaragua. Also pray for um, just the, the new um, work of doing full-time ministry. We were both doing like secular work on florist and mechanic, and we want to be in full-time ministry. That was my dream, and that's what we want to do. And, uh, of course, there's different challenges, different pace of life, and, and different um, uh, spiritual things you have to deal with, and just really being close to God is what we need. And just pray for us with that. And just pray for the receptiveness of this San Marcos where we're going. Um, just think of uh, moving into a new neighborhood. It's either they, they get along with you great or it's, sometimes it's hard. or It takes time to build trust, right? Like, just think of that if you've ever moved to a new neighborhood or new town or new city. It's like this on ten times because uh, for, for foreigners moving into a new town. So pray for us in that. And um, just pray for us for our awareness of God's leading because we need to see where God wants us to how God wants us to work on a daily basis, and um, just pray for encouragement on a daily basis that we'll, um, that we'll have the passion to share um, all, every day. So yeah, like I said before, please stay in touch. Here are our emails and the mail for Grace Ministry International. And if you, uh, at the end, want to visit our table, we, um, you want to sign there to receive our prayer letters or receive one of these cards. Um, yeah, and just be in touch. In the back of the car is our WhatsApp. That's the most, I don't know, fun and useful uh, way to be connect. And yeah, we would love to be in touch with you. And thank you so much for your time. So, well, thank you, uh, Jonathan and Brenda. Uh, you'll be hearing more uh, from them during the adult Bible class. Uh, they'll be speaking more about their ministry. But uh, now uh, I'd like to introduce to you someone who everyone should know. You're a member of our church, uh, Joe and Michelle Campos. Uh, and Joe was also a uh, pastor of discipleship here at uh, Frontline Bible Church. And so we welcome you back and to talk to us about your ministry in Brazil. As you know, Joe does all the talking. <laughs> We're Joe and Michelle. And I, most of you know us, and we know most of you because this is our home church. And before I go sit down, because Joe, like I said, he's going to be doing the talking, I have a couple questions for my home church. First, did everybody get one of these? It says here that we're missionaries through Things to Come Mission serving in southern Brazil. Now, if you know me, you know that I live in northern Brazil because that's where it's warm. The Kressmeyers are in southern Brazil. We're not in southern Brazil. We're in northern Brazil. Now, don't give God any ideas because he might send us to a cold place. <laughs> and we're happy where we are. My second question is, when I left, I think most of you knew that in Brazil we speak Portuguese, not Spanish. Now, I come here, and I have my two Brazilian friends singing in Spanish today, so I don't know what you did, <laughs> but that was not the right language to be speaking here. It's supposed to be Portuguese, so our church is changing, honey. Yeah. <laughs> but I'll let you talk. Thanks, Michelle. Well, at least you guys are one step closer to the heavenly language Portuguese. No, you practice a little bit of Spanish, so you're halfway there now. Well, I wanted to start off by uh, showing you guys a video of what you participate for the last few years, which is the Project ABBA. Uh, many of you have given towards this project, has prayed over this project. We have this project year-round, but then at the end of the year, we do what we call celebrations, Christmas celebrations, where we reach out... Um, uh, great group of kids. So I wanted to show you guys now this video and then we'll get to uh, spend some time in scripture. What 
is the most important group that you've ever belonged to? Your family. Now, they could have impacted you in a positive way. They could have impacted you in a negative way. But they had a big influence in your life. Many kids don't have positive influences. And what if you can make that kid this Christmas feel like they were loved, feel like they were cherished, feel like they belong? That is what Project Abba has been doing for many years. And we have impacted the lives of thousands of kids through your partnership. And we would like to keep on doing so. In 2024, we plan to reach many more kids for the grace of God and show them that they belong to this family. And that's why we are calling you through your prayers, your donations, your gifts, your service, to be able to become partners with us in 2024 and bless the lives of many kids. So why don't you, in 2024, come join Project Alpha. impacting the world together with us. As you watch this video, we have reached uh, approximately 350 kids during the Christmas celebration this year. We have many that have trusted the Lord as their personal Savior, and they know now that there is a God that loves them and cares about them and wanted to relay with them and have something to do with their lives. And we appreciate each one of you that has been believing in this ministry and been investing in this ministry. Um, as I was hearing uh, Jonathan and Brenda, uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't help but think that Brenda started to be a missionary even way before she became a full-time missionary, what she's looking for. And she didn't have to leave her job. She didn't have to quit what she was doing. She just took her lunch, you know, to some place and had a talk with someone. And then you can do the same thing. As we're doing that in Brazil, you can do it here. You can do it everywhere. And quite frankly, um, I think that most people are not involved with world missions because they're not involved with local missions, which is start right in the heart. And that's what I'd like to talk to you about this morning. I wanted to talk to you about three very important truths about missions. And uh, if you go and search the scripture, you're not going to find the word mission or missions or missionary there, as you're not going to find the word rapture. But even though you're not finding these words in scripture, does not mean they're not very scriptural. Uh, the concept and the thought is there. And if you know anything about God's heart, his heart, one, his one intention is to save mankind. And it's, as you open the you know, scripture, you see him dealing with Adam and Eve and then right after announcing that what he is going to do is right after they fell and they horribly turned away from him and started living in self-sufficiency was that he was going to make a way to reconcile them to them. So God, right from the start, it's a missionary God. He has one intention, which is to save mankind. In 1 Timothy 2, verse 4, says this, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the precise truth. God wants us to live from truth. He wants us to live in freedom. And freedom only is attained when you know the truth. Because the truth, only the truth, will set people free. Nothing else will set them free. Financial stability won't set them free. Uh, health will not set them free. Uh, good relationships with family would not set them free. There's only one thing that sets people free. It is the truth. 
nothing but the truth. And that's why when Paul writes to his son in the faith, Timothy, he is very specific about the word before the truth. He says precise truth. It's not just some kind of truth or a part of the truth. It's precise truth. And there's three simple truths about mission. If you are willing to engage with mission, if you are willing to really be a participant of what God is doing in the world, and He wants to do it through you and you, you need to know precisely what mission is. And the first truth about mission, it is mission, it is the heart of God. It is the heart of God. It is interesting that God had only one son. And he could have keep it for himself. He could cherish. He could have really like spend some time with him and throughout eternity and not share with the world. But he decided to make that only son he had a missionary. He could have done anything with his son. But his son and him agree we are going to save the world. I'm going to send you as a missionary. In Mark Chapter 1, verse 38, we find these words from Christ himself. And he said to them, let's go unto the next towns, that I may preach there also, for that is why I came. The reason you were born, the reason God saved you, was so he could have a relationship with you, have you enjoying life abundantly, and that you would become a channel of that life to other people. That is the number one reason you were set free. Paul had the same focus about the mission God had given him. Look at your Bibles, if you will, in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. And look what he describes to be the mission. The mission that he was entrusted. The mission that he entrusted to us under this era of grace that we live right now. He says, to me, though, I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. While on earth, Christ's focus was to save the Israelites, and through the Israelites was to save the world. But Paul's focus was to make the message of the cross the reason for him to live. He felt so humble that God, of all, of all the people in the universe, pick him. Pick him. And he calls himself the least of the saints. Do you know what that word is in the original? It's a cyst. Have you seen a cyst? Some cyst, you have to look at the microscope to see it. So that's how Paul sees himself in the plan of God. In the worldwide plan of God. But there's one thing that he knows. I might be small, but I'm a part of it. I might not be this big guy, but I know I have a big God that can use this big guy to create a greater impact for history. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul became. He became our apostle. And the whole idea of Paul here is to de-emphasize the messenger and emphasize the message. The message is what sets people free. We are just channels of this message. The unsearchable riches of Christ is what is to be emphasized. It doesn't matter what walk of life you're from, if you're a good communicator, if you're not as good as other people are, if you don't feel comfortable, you know, in doing something. The unsearchable riches of Christ that dwells in you is now to be shared with people around you. You just, to trust, you just need to trust the Lord. Just trust Him. Take a step of faith. Take a leap of faith. Just trust Him in your workplace, in your neighborhood. You know, people that you relate to, they do not know this truth and they need to know this truth. The searchable riches means the abundance, the fullness, that can only be found when a person unites himself to the Savior, Jesus Christ. It is in him that there is life. In nothing else there is life. There might be a fake life in some things. And we are really good at trying. 
but you are not going to be satisfied fully by those things. I remember as vivid as today, you know, many, many years ago in 1993, exactly 7th of March, when I was, a week before that date, I was sitting in my living room and wondering, what am I going to do with my life? What am I going to do with my life? I was 19 years old, didn't have a plan, didn't know what to do, didn't know the reason of my existence, didn't care about much. I had tried everything in the book of, you know, self in, in flesh patterns that you can possibly think, and nothing would satisfy me, nothing would complete me, nothing would fill me. And then I took a leap of faith, and I accepted an invitation to go to a church, a church that I didn't know, preach the truth. And there I heard for the first time in my life that God loved me and He cared about me. He sent His Son to die for me. And if I trusted Him, He would make me new. He would give me a new identity. He would give me a new way of life. He would give me abundant life. And at that moment, I trusted the Lord. In that same living room, I prayed the first honest prayer of my life. And I said, God, I don't know what's happening. I just know that you love me and you died for me in the cross. Just help me to learn more of this. I just, that's what I want. And at that moment, a new life for me began. And a new life for others can begin as you take that same truth to these individuals that you know. We are missionaries. No matter what we are doing right now, that is a higher calling. I don't have words to describe how different my life is today from that time because one person invited me to church and another person would care about enough about other people that decided to preach the word to me. I grew up in the Catholic country and Catholics, I don't know if you know much about it, you know, we have two ways to relate to God. One is you relate to God by thinking that he's about to get you. So you better keep, you know, straight, otherwise he's going to get you and zap you or something. Or the other way is, you know, you start doing good stuff to do not kind of balance the bad stuff you're doing. And that's exactly what I, what, I, what I did for 19 years of my life. When I was a teenager, I started, you know, very young, almost before as a teenager, drinking very heavily. And I remember coming, you know, drunk from parties many times. And I had this little Gideon New Testament that I got in eighth grade from the Gideons that went to our school. And I opened up in the Gospels because I thought the Gospel, you know, read like cartoons, and I love cartoons. So there's like storylines and action and stuff like that. So I'll read that, and then I'll pray the Rosemary and the Father's Prayer. And then I kind of went to this, you know, self-cleaning kind of idea that I developed. That was a crazy religious way that just left me even more empty. It didn't completely, it didn't clean me, it didn't do anything, it didn't change me. Because right, right after, I was doing the same very thing I did the night before. It was Christ that changed me. It was Christ that moved me. It was Christ that filled me with life. And it is that Christ that is the heart of mission. That was what God wanted us to share with the world. And the second truth about mission is that mission is not only the heart of God, but mission is the hope of the condemned. There's a story told of a philosophical, agnostic professor of a big shot university that went to the Fiji island. And there he met the chief of the tribe, the most popular tribe in the Fiji island. And he observed a little bit, and these guys had, you know, but about a year had been converted to Christianity from cannibalism. And uh, he started telling, you know, I'm glad that what you're doing here with your tribe, you seem to be a wise guy and all of that, but I'm very disappointed that you bought into this old tradition of Christianity. What's up with that? That is so ridiculous. It's empty. No one is believing this, where I come from anymore. It's, it's you know, it's, it's a... It's a fade. It, it's not going to get you anywhere. So what are you doing? The guy look at this guy and says, you see that rock over there? The guy look at the rock and there's still marks of blood and stuff. And Yeah, that is where we would get our victims and we smash their heads on that rock. You see 
that stove right by it yes that was where we used to cook the victims that we ate and you know if it wasn't for that God that didn't exist according to you you would be my last next next supper and that is what we need to realize God is the hope of the condemned and no matter where you are what you do God can reach you in Romans chapter 10 verses 12 and 13 we read this for there's no distinction between Jew and Greek for the same Lord is the Lord of all bestowing his riches on all who call on him for everyone who calls everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved God does not play favors many times we believe we are better off than the majority of people just because we believe that Christ died for us and in one respect uh, I will have to say you know we are but if we are living in a religious relationship with God we live a dry superficial lifestyle with Christ the Christian life is not about rules and regulation it is about resting in Jesus Christ for our needs and our desires and the fulfillment of his dreams upon us when we share the gospel we are not just explaining to people how to get to heaven and how to escape hell and burning we are sharing a relationship that free us to live a life of rest not wrestling working for no purpose whatsoever that is what we are sharing and many of us think that the only reason Jesus saved us was to spend eternity with him but look what the verse 12 says that he saved us to be what to be rich in him rich in him the word rich here carries the meaning of being full satisfied filled. this is the hope of Christ if you are satisfying yourself in Christ you will lose the desire of any kind of life this is the gospel we preach it is the gospel of reconciliation we are reconciling people to the source of life where strongholds are broken where we struggle is lose his power and that is the appealing message that we proclaim it is setting people free from their own strategy of living setting them free from a mindset of living from themselves it is replacing a carnal desire of meeting our own needs and trusting in ourselves to trust the only true God that provides for our needs according to the riches of Jesus Christ Philippians 4 19 that is the gospel and we a lot of times we only share half of the gospel we got to share the full gospel that's why we're not seeing change that's why we're not seeing the hope of the condemned actually filling people and having them completely change from the inside out that is the message Christ has entrusted us with and the last truth that I'd like to share with you this morning about mission so you can go out of here as ready as you can to be a missionary is that be, besides mission is the heart of God and the hope of the condemned mission is the health of the church mission is the health of the church look at with me in 2 Corinthians 6 1 look what Paul says about this working together with them then we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain what this verse is literally saying is that we are partners with God he graciously allow us to be part of spreading his grace to the world the amazing thing for me about this verse is the word together because in Greek it, 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 it's the word synergio and synergio is the word that we derive English word synergy and synergy literally means the interaction of two or more agents or forces 
so that the combined effect is greater than the sum of the individual effects. Think about this. God basically lit him himself so he can count on you, so he can activate his power on earth. Did you hear this? I mean, this is amazing. You and God, it's a great team. You and God and me is the greatest team that has ever existed. No one can stop it. No, Satan can resist it. He tried. He has many times throughout history tried to kill Christianity, and he has not succeeded. And he is not going to succeed it because the book has been closed. The final word has been written, and there is a victory that has been declared over this world. And the victorious, it is God and Christ and those that belong to him. You are victorious. Have you realized that? And when you live this out, okay, you will get to make more victorious people around you. I believe this is the reason why Paul says in the later part of the verse, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. And I wanted to encourage you this morning. But, well, I actually wanted to challenge you this morning. I wanted to commend you this morning that you do not receive the grace of God in vain. That's your calling. Your calling is for you to enjoy grace, the love, kindness, the life, the filling of the Holy Spirit, the joy that comes with it, the delight, the strength, the power, the freedom, and that's entailed in the God that has given His grace through His Son Jesus Christ. That is the grace that you've been called to enjoy and you've been called to share. Can you see why Paul, he's so passionate about this to the point of really challenging people not to tra take the grace of God lightly? He is here saying, Corinthians, don't do this. Don't you realize what you have? And it is only when a church preaches the truth about grace that its mission of God is fulfilled. Only when the church preaches about grace this grace. Man, this is powerful. For me, this is the most powerful and humbling truth anyone can chew on and live off and really enjoy. Because if you realize something, the Christian that does not evangelize, that does not share grace, you will fossilize. In the church that does not have a plan to reach its community, to reach beyond his community, to each the states of the, the states around it, the countries around it, it will fail miserably in taking the grace of God in vain. That is the basic three truths about mission. Now you are equipped to be a missionary, because now you know the missions is the heart of God, the missions is the hope of the condemned, and then mission, mission, is the health of the church. I'd like to conclude by saying this. Christ alone can save the world. But Christ cannot save the world alone. Did you get this? That is the truth. He chose you to be his partner. He chose me to be his partner. Have you noticed everywhere you travel, you see Coca-Cola? Everywhere you go, you see Coca-Cola. I mean, don't matter where you go. You go to a stink village in South Africa, and you see there, Coke there. Do you know how these guys got there? I believe the secret, it isn't the slogan that they have in the headquarters that reads, think globally, but act locally. Think globally, act locally. That is your call. That is my call. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we can spend together as the body of Christ this morning. We ask you, Lord, with this challenge from your word, you send us off here thinking more and more of the mission you have called us. We ask you these things in the greatest missionary that ever exists, Christ himself. Amen. Thank you, Joe. So you'll be hearing more about Joe during the uh, adult Sunday school class, but 
Right now, I would like uh, Joe and Michelle and uh, where are they? Uh, Nathan and not. I'm sorry, Jonathan and Brenda. Sorry, I went to school with your dad, Nathan. So, I mean, Jonathan. So, if you both, if you all come up here, and uh, I would like the congregation to come up here, and I'm going to ask Dwayne Huff um, uh, to come and pray for us and pray over the missionaries. Come on up, folks. There's room in the center here. Don't be afraid to, to fill this space. Let's pray together. Father God, it is such a privilege to stand here together as your body, to know that each of us has a role to play. And we thank you for the role that, that Jonathan and Brenda are going to be playing and have played. We thank you for Joe and Michelle and the role they're playing. And we thank you for the challenge today. God, we, we, we know that that's your heart, that other people come to know you and, and put their faith in you. And we know that you use people to accomplish that. So thank you for Joe and Michelle, the work they've been doing in Brazil for many years, for Jonathan and Brenda as they look to go to Nicaragua and plant a church. And God, we ask that you would, you would go with them, that you would go before them, that you would empower them, that you would guide them, that you would give them wisdom, that you would uh, bring people to their minds, bring people to connect with them, and just just like the, the people that Brenda reached out to in the park, the homeless people, God, may you continue to put people in their path that they can raise up and train and equip as leaders, and God, through that, may you grow your church in Brazil, may you grow your church in Nicaragua, may you grow your church in Byron Center. So God, we, we pray your blessing on them, we pray your blessing on their ministry, their families, we pray your blessing on Frontline Bible Church, and that we would all have a heart for missions and reaching the lost. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.